Good evening, everybody. Welcome back for another edition of Reasonable Doubt. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, and uh, unfortunately, my co-host, he's not here tonight. He's out, uh, I don't know, he's, he had prior commitments is what he said. We'll forgive him for this time, but uh, in his place, I have two really great guests returning to the show, my good friend, Dame Ball. Dame, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Glad back. to have you here. It man. took a long time to get invited back. Uh, yeah, that's 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 my fault. Uh, actually, I think I invited you a couple of times and you had conflicts, much like Julio has tonight. You had you had prior engagements and uh, couldn't make it. So well, I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm I'm glad you could make it. And first time on the show, Ashley yes. McFarland. Yes, thanks for having uh, me. Glad to have you guys on. Uh, it's going to be a great show, ladies and gentlemen. We are we are probably going to spend most of the night talking about the Mueller report. It's the first time that, uh, as, as it's colloquially known, the Mueller report, I think it's actually uh, got, a, got a more it official It has another title. name. Yeah, <laughs> oh. official title, uh, if you read the pages. But um, we're going to spend most of the time with that. Of course, uh, Dane is a fellow white-collar criminal defense lawyer like myself, and Ashley, in addition to her uh, now life as a white-collar criminal defense lawyer with uh, David Gerger, Sammy Khalil, and Matt Hennessy's firm. She is a former DOJ prosecutor. I am. Uh, you were you were here on the in Southern District on the healthcare fraud task force. That's right. Um, and so I think I want to I want to kind of use that because we've seen a lot of task force around the country. We've seen the healthcare fraud task force. We saw the Enron task force years mm -hmm, ago. Mm -hmm. It's always a task force going around. And, uh, <laughs> I think they're kind of similar to the special counsel investigation. So I want to get your thoughts on that. Obviously, we're going to we're going to delve deep. It's 488 pages. There's no way we're going to cover it all. But this is the first time we've actually got to talk about it in some detail on this show. And uh, I'm glad I could bring on two experienced federal lawyers to talk about it with me. And really what I don't want to do is I don't want to give the misimpression here. Look, we're not political pundits, okay? We're not going to be opining about whether what, what Congress's next steps will be. We might, we might guess, but we're in no way political pundits. We're actual practicing lawyers. And so, you know, we're going to give you a view of what it's like from our point of view, okay? What we see every day and how this differs from not just what, you know, Dane and I have been doing for years on the private practice, but what Ashley saw on the government side prior to getting into private practice in criminal defense. And, th and there's a lot of things that I think a lot of people don't understand, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And hopefully we can clear that up tonight. And if you want to get in on the conversation, you can hit us up on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV, or you can call into the show, 713-807-1794 is the number. We, we welcome any and all comments. And uh, you know, even if you have political comments and you want to make your voice known, by all means, we may not be able to address them because, again, we're not political pundits. But uh, Let's just jump right into it, guys. I mean, this is, we've, this is, to me, this is not how most criminal investigations are handled in our world. At all. <laughs> At all. all. It, it is such an anomaly um, that, as I remarked recently to some federal prosecutors that I had a case with, um, and we were trying to negotiate a resolution, and, and I thought the price point for resolution was way too high, I, I stopped him and I said, look guys, I'm just going to be honest with you. The problem that I have in resolving this case with you guys is the, the public and what the public is seeing right now, and that includes my client and several other clients, is they see that your pr price point is way too high compared to what's going on with the special counsel's investigation. That whether or not it's true or not, I'm just telling you what the perception is. The perception that's out there from the media and I, and I think this report kind of lays out, we were talking a little bit about before the show, but if you just listen to the media and the media reports, you thought Michael Flynn was a traitor, a treasoner. You thought, you know, Papadopoulos was the same thing. You thought all this stuff, and here these, are, here these guys are committing these horrific crimes against the country, and they're getting away with slaps on the wrist. I mean, yeah. Flynn's plea agreement, when it came out, I talked about it on the show, I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never seen a plea agreement with a agreed guideline range so low. Well, he hasn't been sentenced yet, right? Right. Yeah. And I think initially the judge rejected it. He did have some hesitation about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I, I've never seen an agreed guideline range that came out at zero to six months. 
Yeah, well, there's a lot of <laughs> lot of things about this case that are unique and not mm -hmm. that we don't see every day. Um, you started with one of them um, by noting that Ashley was on a, a on a task force, and and I want to start to show off by disagreeing with you, but you said there were some similarities between a task force and a special prosecutor. And while there are, yeah, um, there's a lot of differences too. So I, I I'd like to spend a little time on on the differences there Absolutely. because a task force typically looks at a, a very big and serious problem and then dedicates resource to it, and they can do a lot of good. Um, a special prosecutor or an independent prosecutor, when there used to be one, um, don't look at a, usually a really big problem, but more so specific people, and then they throw their resources at that. And in my experience, which has mostly been observing from here to Washington, is that task force are really good at, 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 at solving problems, and special prosecutions, to me, tend to result in making more criminals than they find. Well, sure. <laughs> right? They create yeah. them in the process, which is... Uh, significantly what's happened here, right? People yeah. lie in the process, people obstruct, uh, and you end up making more criminals than existed before your investigation started. How do, how do you feel, Ashley, about the fact that, because I talked to a former agent uh, this week who was just disgusted with the fact that the, the, the use of 1,001 counts and obstruction of justice uh, to, to really try and leverage people in such a significant investigation. Mm -hmm. um, how do you mm -hmm. feel about that, having been a former DOJ prosecutor? It's interesting that a former agent would say that to you, um, because when I was a prosecutor, it was often the agents that were trying to get me to charge a 1001 for folks that were, and 1001 for the folks at home is a, is a false statement charge for anyone that spoke to an FBI agent or a federal um, a federal agent and misrepresented something or lied or wasn't completely forthcoming about something. And I'll tell you, uh, for a really aggressive prosecutor, you could probably charge everyone, almost everyone that talks to an agent or talks to you with a 1001 charge, which yeah. is a felony up to five years statutory max. Um, and so I think, to me, I think um, it happens a lot. I think this is an example of what goes on all around the country all the time because it's such an easy charge to make. And you're right, it can be used as leverage um, against folks to maybe cooperate with investigation. Sometimes it's used to allow folks to plead to a lesser charge when there may be evidence for, of a greater charge. <clears throat> um, but it shows you the sheer power that federal prosecutors have because there are so many charges that can be brought for such what I think the public would think are little things yeah. that someone's that someone's doing. Um, I think in this case, in the mother investigation, it's hard to know whether there were more egregious charges that they just didn't charge because the individuals were cooperating. Right. And, and uh, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Manual says that they're supposed to bring the highest charges possible. That's right. And and in this case, you know, they they didn't do that. I mean, clearly they just with, with Flynn and Papadopoulos, they brought menial charges. Um, and we'll never know, I don't think, and I don't think we really get a good explanation of whether or not. I mean, it seems on its face that had Flynn and Papadopoulos just shut the hell up, they would have never gotten charged, right? I think that's right. I mean, that's the risk you take when you're facing, as all of our clients do, the decision to cooperate or not cooperate. Um, you know, there's this human nature to feel like, well, if I don't cooperate, i.e. if I don't talk, they're going to think I'm guilty. I always tell them they think you're guilty anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so um, you're not you know, going to dissuade them of that notion. either, Right. And so um, there's cooperate, there's don't cooperate. And then there's the worst option of all, which is cooperate the wrong way, which mm -hmm. people yeah. did in this case, too. Um, that's the <laughs> that's the worst thing you can do. Um, get rid of your right to a trial, get rid of your defense, lay down on your sword and then not reap the benefits of that's right. Operating in the end, but but before you get too far off yeah. it, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you said you know, a, a similarity between the cases. You know, this power to charge people with a thousand and one and obstruction mm -hmm. and, and perjury and things like that. Um, I will tell you though, in this case, if you look at the number of people who are looked at, um, or key people who are looked at, and the number of thousand and one charges. That's and that's. You not applied common. those yeah. across the nation to every investigation. We would. Three quarters of us would be in jail, right? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It, it would be absurd. Be because the thing is, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? And all in the eye of the agent of whether or not you lied to them. 
Right. Or and and the prosecutor as well. Um, but I'll tell you, I'll say this. I think that's what shows the difference in the uniqueness about this particular high profile uh, investigation and case. Um, there really was nothing like it in history. And I think the pressure and the attention it that's the difference between something like this and like a task force, mm -hmm. because with all the eyes on the special counsel and on this team of prosecutors, they have to produce. Well, I agree with you on that. But, you know, you were on the health care fraud task force, mm -hmm. which has been a huge problem. I mean, the the, the task force or health care fraud? Well, yeah, the, no, the, no, the health care fraud. I'm OK. I mean, I, 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 yeah. Uh, no, I, I actually don't think there has been. Um, I mean, I, I thought there was significant abuses in the Enron task force. Um, but I do not think that the health care fraud task force has been abusive. Quite contrary. I mean, my experience was that you could always have upfront, frank discussions. I mean, and, and in fact, some some of the prosecutors on the task force would come to me at the very front and say, hey, you know, I, I know we took this charge and you weren't involved in the very beginning. And they were very upfront, you know. We, we really didn't have a good rapport with the previous lawyer. We think there may be some advice of counsel defense here, but we never really got that far with the other lawyer. Please mm -hmm. come talk to us kind mm -hmm. of thing. So mm -hmm. I've never really seen any kind of abuses or, you know, games on the health care fraud task force. What I will say, though, is I, I, I do think that the health care fraud task force is, has, was really aggressive in going after very high sentences. Um, and, and didn't, w was not really willing. So even though they might be willing to talk to you and say, hey, was there a defense here? If you got past that, I mean, it was, we're not giving you a, well, a, a five-year cap to plead to or anything like that. Well, or right. Well, cap. as you mentioned earlier, the justice manual requires prosecutors mm -hmm. to go after the, um, the highest charge. Right. And oftentimes it's health care fraud, which is a 10-year stat max or the health care fraud conspiracy, or you know, money laundering with 20 years. Yep. Um, and it, the sentencing guidelines in those cases. They're rough. They're rough because they go according to the loss amounts. And in these health care fraud cases, you have multi, multi-million dollar loss to yes. the Medicare program and to other federal programs. Um, and that's what oftentimes determines the sentences, not necessarily the prosecutors. Yeah, and I mean, it, Unlike this case, I mean, they could have charged money laundering if they wanted to. Uh, they could have charged wire fraud uh, if they wanted to, um, but they didn't. They chose for Papadopoulos and Flynn to bring the, the false statement counts right from the beginning. Well, and I think that actually that may have been a benefit to them. I agree. If, if they had the evidence to charge them with money laundering, a 20-year stat max felony, um, and they came over early to cooperate um, and to be forthcoming, um, then a five-year cap with a 1,001 um, seems like a great deal. It, it's really hard because we don't know the whole story, right? I mean, we've got a lot of redactions mm -hmm. here um, for obvious reasons. I mean, there's still, there's an, and, and that's what, that's what drives me so freaking crazy is we need to see the whole report. Well, right. wait a second. There's, there's still an active grand jury investigation right. going on. You still got Roger Stone who, like him or not, he's still got a right to a fair trial. You know, and if you disclose the whole thing, it's, it's not hard to figure out where in the report Roger Stone is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, mm -hmm. when you start looking down the names, it's blacked out, ongoing matter. I mean, mm -hmm. it would be prejudicial to him. And as a defense attorney, the last thing I would want is this report coming out when my client still has the right to a, a, a fair and impartial jury trial. Right. Uh, uh, the, the redaction issue should be non non-controversial. Exactly. I mean, um, uh, the, the buckets of information that are redacted in there are kind of par for the course, right? Right. Grand jury materials, which we never get to see. Right? No. No. Um, and um, you know, personal information and ongoing investigations. Um, so that's just. I mean, those are statutes, not even just policy, that that really shouldn't be controversial. Um, the interesting thing to me, though, about DOJ policy and kind of the, the, the content and release of the report um, is uh, this comment by Mueller that, you know, he, he did not exonerate the president um, after many, many pages of specific instances that could be read to um, be damning. Sure. Right? Um, because there's a DOJ policy um, to not publicly accuse someone who you're not going to indict. Um, 
I kind of have a question here about whether that DOJ policy was followed or whether it was seen as not applicable um, or knowingly disregarded. But don't you think, I mean, what, I, I had a prosecutor, the, you know, the story I was telling you uh, about how I was trying to negotiate, and one of the responses was that I got from a local prosecutor here was, well, it's different when you're providing information about the President of the United States. You tend to get better deals when it's a matter of national security. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I get that. I understand your point. But at the same time, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, yeah, but in some regards, you know, is it that they're, I mean, to, and I'm, I'm not trying to be a defender of everything the president has done or, you know, validate what he has said in any way at all. But you have to, in some regards, look at it and, 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 and honestly take a look at whether or not this was an investigation that, that was funneled in one direction, and that was to try and get the president. And at the end of the day, what do we have? We have this. Um, and they, they, it's, it's almost as if they hit kind of a, not a brick wall, but, you know, a, a wall that they really couldn't get past. I don't think there's any question that the, the goal of this investigation was to find something on Trump and the Trump campaign. Right. right? I mean, it was all but set out in the the, the, in the title, <laughs> right? Um, I, I think that's pretty remarkable, right? Um, I don't know many, I don't know that many people and companies and organizations that could undergo a two-year microscope of 2,800 subpoenas and 500 interviews and 30 million dollars and um, and come up just squeaky clean. Which, right. as to Russian if not collusion, conspiracy, what, whatever you want to call it, um, wasn't there. And Well, wait a minute. I don't think anybody came out of this squeaky clean. No. Um, and in fact, I think, one, I think there was, there was clear evidence that Russia interfered in our elections. I mean, that's, that is widely accepted in all the law enforcement communities. Yeah. And um, also kind of known before the investigation started. That's right. Well, that's what that's what Just initiated saying. the investigation. So I don't think it was necessarily started to get Trump, President Trump. But right. there was evidence that that Russia interfered in our elections um, to support candidate Trump. Um, and there was a question uh, and some evidence about whether there was some uh, coordination or an agreement between the campaign and uh, the Russians to to do that. I think the investigation then turned um, towards President Trump once there were actions by him to um, interfere with the special counsel or interfere um, with um, their obstructions uh, investigation. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, they did start to, I mean, you've got, of course, the, the situation where he's alleged to have told uh, White House counsel to fire the special counsel um, and then lie about what I told you to right. do. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, I, I agree with you. I don't think I don't think he comes off squeaky cl clean at all. And not to mention the fact that they said, I mean, I think there was a clear distinction, right? On the volume one dealing with the conspiracy yes. with Russians, they said they found no evidence of, or su they did not find sufficient evidence of a conspiracy. Correct. Right. Second part of the report that dealt with the obstruction, they said, uh, if we had found that there were no, n there was not sufficient evidence, we would have said, said that. So, yeah. They didn't say that. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, um, well, I, I've got it pulled up right here. You know, they... Um, and the only that? reason that they didn't conclude that... Um, that he that the president did not obstruct justice was because they couldn't accuse him of a crime yeah. given that he's a sitting president this was this was one of the paragraphs that i had, had marked the concerns about the fairness of such a determination would be heightened in the case of a sitting president and this is you know of course regarding uh, whether or not there was obstruction of justice and um they, they talk about citing to uh, as you know, what constitutes a federal offense uh, of a sitting president where, the, where a federal prosecutor's accusation of a crime, even in an internal report, could carry consequences that extend beyond the realm of criminal justice. Um, you know, they talk about the difficulty of preserving a sealed indictment, that it would likely get out right. and harm the presidency and the president's term and the stigma that could come with it. Um, 
and you know, the, they, they talked about how the fact that to accuse a president of a crime, uh, essentially, in, in this manner where they could not bring an indictment and allow him to clear his name, clear his name mm -hmm. through the court systems, mm -hmm. through the right to a speedy trial, through the right to confront and compel, you know, confront witnesses and compel witnesses on him, his behalf. That's where they went in that analysis on this. Well, look, I mean, that's not a foreign concept, right? It's got right. a name, it's due process, it's in the Constitution. So, right. I mean, that that is, and that's the DOJ policy that I referred to before. I mean, the, the par for the course is you do not publicly accuse an individual who you're not going to charge with a crime. Yeah. I don't know of an exception letting the special counsel off the hook for that. Um, so in my view, um, it's kind of a remarkable statement to say, um, Hey, hey, by the way, had we found anything exonerating him, we would have let you know, and, and we didn't find any. Because to me, your job, right, Robert Mueller's a prosecutor. Prosecutor's mm -hmm. job is to bring charges or decline charges. And it really stops there, to me. So um, once they decided internally, if that's what they determined, that you can't charge the president, why list all of these instances and then say, we Here, have an exoneration? Here's why I think. And we have to keep this in the context that this is a very special circumstance. Right. Um, and I think they talked about the fact that the public interests um, weighed in favor of them outlining this. But not only that, this whole report is an outline for Congress. Absolutely. They, I think they wanted to outline the steps they went through, the evidence that they gathered, because they didn't want to preempt the constitutional process for impeachment. They said, OK, we'll just let you know exactly what we did, how we did it and what we have so that Congress can do their job. Um, and because there is no other instance other than a sitting president where this would be relevant, I think they had to go to extraordinary measures that usually you're right. A prosecutor would never do that, would never say, um, oh, we would let you know if we can exonerate him, but we can't. Um, but I think because this is involving a sitting president of the United States, it had to be a very unique circumstance. Yeah, and I think the other thing too, and we were talking before we went on the show about you know whether or not this this concept of whether or not a president could even obstruct justice in this context. You know, I mean, does does he have the right to make these statements? You mean uh, about the public statements that he made up to to Cohen and to yes. Flynn. Right, and, and or or even going a step further, the statements that he makes to White House counsel. Um, mm. You know, I mean, he, he's he's making he is the chief executive, right? And mm -hmm. in his role as the chief executive, correct me if I'm wrong, but he is the head of the Department of Justice. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think that goes to motive, right? It does. I, um, it, it goes to motive. Yes, I think a president can obstruct justice. Yes, I think that public statements just because they're public doesn't mean that they aren't also satisfying the elements of obstruction of justice. It's all about your intent. And if there was a corrupt intent to interfere with an investigation, whether it be uh, um, you know, a congressional hearing or a FBI investigation, I think that would be obstruction. Um, there's a reason why there's a separation of, of uh, the three branches of government here. Yeah. There's a reason why his counsel advised him do not talk to DOJ about this investigation. <clears throat> so, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any question that a president can obstruct, right? I mean, I think right. if, if President Trump was being uh, investigated for something and there was evidence on his cell phone and he, you know, burned it, you know, that'd be obstruction. But in this context, I, I have real questions about the, the types of things that were listed in the Mueller report. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of problems there. One is a lot of them have to do with his constitutional executive authority, right? At the end of the day, um, it, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, um, you know, people in the executive branch, which includes the Justice Department, which includes even Mueller, um, they report to him. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I would worry about the precedent of going after people for um, doing things that you think their motive was bad, but but they actually have the authority, the absolute authority to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then you have other issues like, um, you know, he didn't sit down and talk to him, um, which I think was one of his unquestionably wise, wise things. Yeah. Um, but, but think about it this way. I mean, you know, your boss has the authority to fire you. But if their motive in firing you is because 
they don't like you because you're a woman or you're a man or you're whatever, that's their motive. That's behind their action. They had the authority yeah. to fire you. But it's illegal to do that for certain yeah. bases. Yeah, I agree. The, the other problem, though, is that the statute requires corrupt intent. Um, and you know, a lot of what he did, um, he either did in public or he did in private and then told the public that he did it. And yeah, he so wasn't hiding it. <laughs> it's, it's hard to do things. This is my, my own personal theory here. Um, it's hard to act corruptly in a public way. Right. And, I tend and there are actually statutes like the bribery statutes that require corrupt intent that my theory is they cannot be violated unless done secretly. Right. Because there's like a bribery statute that um, on its face would apply to like you tipping a waiter to get better service. Well, what makes it corrupt? Well, it's it's when you you do it secretly yeah. behind. Right. It's the only way to, to draw a distinction. So it, it, it's hard for me to accept that somebody that does things out in the open is, is acting correctly. Let's, let's take your example. You said if he had, uh, someone has um, evidence on their phone that incriminates them, right? Um, and they're in front of a TV camera like this one, mm -hmm. and they bring their phone, and they have some pretenses as to why they're going to destroy their phone on camera for whatever reasons. Let's say they wanted to make a point. But their motive and their intent is, I gotta get rid of this evidence that's on my phone. Um, they did that in public. They destroyed their phone in public. But if their motive and intent is to destroy evidence in an investigation? Yeah, I think the difference in, in your example is that destroying it publicly would still destroy the information on the phone. Whereas what he was doing to try to get someone, you know, fire someone so that they wouldn't do something or wave a carrot in front of somebody, you know, a pardon to get them to do, act a certain way. Once that becomes public, right? There's, there's no deceit there. There's no trickery about what the person is doing and why they're doing it. So I think it's a little different than the public. I, I, I get that, but there's the element of, of, of obstruction. There's no element that requires it be, to be done in secret. It's just all about whether your intent. Yeah, and it's a subjective question. It, it, and honestly, decide. I think it's hard. Yeah, it I think is. it's a really hard, difficult question because of the same points that you're making right now. I think it's really hard to get into the mind of anyone. I think it's a lot easier in your example to sit back if you were 12 people just watching. Uh -huh. okay? if, you were, if, you were, if you were 12 people sitting over here on the other side of the studio and you took your cell phone out and destroyed it uh, and you were just making statements, I think it'd be a lot easier, if I'm on that jury, mm -hmm. to me, it's a lot easier to say, well, her actions were clearly an intent to destroy something versus, you know, well, what, what really was his intent? I mean, yeah. he's not hiding it from us. He's pretty, being pretty open and notorious about it, he's, you know? It's a, it's a much tougher call, I think. Um, so I mean, I, it, it's a factual determination, which is why we have jury trials in this country. Yeah. Well, to, and it, it makes it even more uh, complicated because of, he's the president. Yeah. You know, he makes public statements all the time. Like, that's his job. But remember, our governor got in, in, indicted for essentially making public statements that the, the Court of Appeals here eventually ruled that he had a, he had a First Amendment right to do so. It was political speech, essentially. Right. Um, and I wonder if some of these statements that he's made could potentially fall under that kind of protection. I mean, he is the chief executive, after all. Well, I, and I think it, that's why it says in the Mueller report that even without the Office of Legal Counsel opinion saying that you can't indict a sitting president, there's still going to be issues with the evidence. Yep. Those, these are still difficult questions. Um, there are still uh, defenses. But I think, you know, why go through the analysis that it went through about whether they could keep an indictment sealed or not? or whether these other instances uh, would get out to the public. Why go through that if they did not think they had enough to actually indict? Well, I mean, I think they kind of had to justify their oxygen too, Yeah. right? Well, I, I personally think the real answer is because they, it, it, there was a political motive to it, and I think yeah. they did want to give it to Congress and let Congress do what it thought it should, and I think what it thought it should do is impeach him. Because really, everything you've said I agree with, but. If you're going to make that conclusion, why not just have one paragraph of volume two that says, we've decided that we can't charge a sitting president, and even if we could, there are issues with 
executive authority and the interplay between that and the obstruction statute. Yeah. and it, why, why then well, go through everything I, I, I after think, that? Well, one, because obviously Congress and impeachment, but two. But that's the, but the, but the special counsel's mission is not to lay a roadmap for an impeachment process for Congress. They have their own investigative well, authority. But, but there's the, an, the other thing that they mentioned in the report is that they wanted to preserve the evidence. Such because they believe that a sitting president can be indicted once they're no longer president. And so if they think that there's sufficient evidence to indict, but they just can't, then they wanted to preserve the evidence that they gathered during the investigation um, such that whoever down the line uh, will take it up then. Do you think, do you guys think, you know, for, for a longstanding history in this country we saw with Nixon, um, since since Nixon left and Ford pardoned him, there was just kind of this overall sense of, you know, the country. Yes, this was a bad episode. The country needs to move on with it. You know, mm -hmm. when 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 Clinton went through his impeachment, the Senate refused to convict him, and you know, it kind of went by the wayside. I think since Clinton, we've seen other countries um, who have not shied away from charging their leaders with criminal acts. Um, whereas the United States has been reticent to do so. Um, I mean, do you think we are kind of coming to a point where we may actually consider that? Even once he leaves office for, for, for crimes that he committed while in office. I hope not. So if, for as long as I've been old enough to really follow and care about politics, all I can say is that if we change that rule, um, it seems the political state of our country is that, you know, every president is going to be facing charges, right? Yeah. I mean, it was going to be President Bush for, you know, weapons of mass destruction yeah. and war crimes and President Clinton for whatever it started as and ended with, uh, with you know, Monica Lewinsky. And, um, but there were other things, you know, surrounding that president's and, and now it's, it's bled over to, you know, um, President Trump. So, I mean, it's not something I want to deal with every, you know, every presidential term. It seems like it'd be a bad precedent because when you read this, when you read the Mueller report, one of the takeaways I took from it was, well, crap, Obama sure knew this was going on. He didn't do anything about it. His Obama knew what was going on? The interference in the election. I mean, theoretically, him knowing about, you know, a, a national security breach and not doing anything about it. Could that, I mean, I'm sure you could find a crime somewhere for, you know, at least misprison of a felony. Um, again, you know, it goes back to the fact that in, in the over 300,000 crimes that we have between Title 18, Title 8, Title 21, you know, the CFRs, I mean, we're probably doing, we're probably violating at least one of them right now being on this show. You Weren't know? there sanctions, though? There were. Um, but, but my point is that it sets a dangerous precedent potentially because as you alluded to with Bush um, and the weapons of mass destruction, what, what does a president know? When does he know it? And what actions does he take? Uh, you know, when, what does, I mean, you could probably charge every CIA agent and every, every FBI agent with obstruction of justice for failing to turn in a, a you know, a report on something. Um, I, it's, I just think I agree with you, Dane. It, 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 it potentially sets a bad precedent because we've always said that our country is one that just, you know, look, we recognize the bad behavior, but, you know, we, we as a country just need to kind of set it aside and move on. Um, but I kind of I feel that the tide may be changing a little bit on that. Well, we didn't set it aside and move on with, with Nixon. Uh, I mean, he resigned ultimately, but that's because I think everything was falling around him. Now, I'm not comparing Nixon yeah. to Trump um, was, and the allegations pretty similarity, here. I think. But I, I think we, you know, we're a country of laws and yeah. um, no one is exempt in this country. And I think that's one of the things that makes uh, this country great is that um, while we have lots of issues with our legal system, um, it applies to everyone. Um, well, and so I do see the issues of um, we don't want this process to be corrupted in any way by political gain. We certainly don't want that. We don't want every tit for tat being a basis for uh, criminal charges against the president. No one has the appetite for that. Um, but at the same time, there has to be a line drawn where even the president of the United States is accountable um, to the laws of this country. Um, now, I really respect actually 
the conclusion that the the Mueller team reached here in not finding um, or saying because they could not indict this president that they're not going to just put it out there just for political folly and that they respected the due process and the Constitution here. Um, I, I think that's a testament to our system in this country. Um, but to say in the future that, you know, there would not be conduct that would, uh, I think we would revisit that. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say that a president should always be above the law, even while they're in office. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you on that. I mean, it, they, everybody, everybody seems to hate him so much. <laughs> is the thing. Not um, everybody. I mean, no, he, I, I he's, agree. He's probably he's, got. He's probably still hovering around fifty percent at least approval rating at this point. Um, and Lord knows, with as many people as seem to be wanting to jump in the Democratic primary, he, his, his poll numbers may go up. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so, are we better off with the Mueller report than we were when we started? I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I think from I think in our world, uh, I, I think it has. I think it has caused problems because I think you are seeing even more of a this notion. Well, this divide of of rich versus poor justice, um, and I think this has kind of exacerbated that. Um, you know, you made the statement that nobody is is above the law, and and everybody is is subject to it. But there just seems to be this huge groundswell that is is really coming up in this country right now. That you know, the the disparity between rich and poor in the justice system is that not everybody is treated the same. But that's um, true. Well, it it is, and it isn't. Um, I, I think what's left out is people think that, you know, white collar uh, defendants who have money are, get these slaps on the wrist, i.e. what Flynn gets. And, and this, these are the kind of cases that get all the publicity, right? Um, like what's going on with the college admissions scandal. I mean, these, these people are pleading early and, you know, getting four to six month recommendations or 15 to 21. And I know you can't talk about it because neither can she, uh, yeah. but, you know, right. but and, and <laughs> true. Um, but I mean, and, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on those, but, but I, I think that those are the cases that get the high publicity and get the most attention. You know, people tend to forget that Jeff Skilling got 20 years in prison to start. People tend to forget Jamie Ola's got 24 years in prison. People forget that. Or some Bernie... of these health care fraud defendants. Right. You know, there was a sentence, you Just know, recently. a couple of years ago for 75 years. Yes. 80 years. Yes, that Alan Stanford got 100 years in prison. Bernie <laughs> Madoff got 150 years in prison. Um, so I, I just feel like the notion that, that white-collar defendants are somehow... Um, sentenced more lightly in this country because they have the means to afford lawyers or they have the means to pay restitution. I think at the state level, yes, that's that that more often than not can be the case. But it completely ignores what happens at the federal level where more often than not, I believe, white collar defendants almost get disproportionately higher sentences um, than than some people. And, I, and, and, and I'm talking about, and I don't want to get into, a, I don't think it matters what the race is. Uh, I'm just talking about that I have seen a lot of judges who are much harsher in sure. white collar financial crime cases than say a drug conspiracy case. I've seen the opposite. Yeah. I've seen the opposite. Um, and I don't know what the data is. I'm sure we can look at the statistics on the Fifth Circuit or the, mm -hmm. the other sentencing commission uh, statistics about that. Um, but I have seen cases when I was a prosecutor where judges could relate to white collar defendants. They could see them as themselves or their neighbor or um, or a friend. And I've had judges actually say on the record that to a person like that, a federal sentence, jail time, it, they take it harder. It's the collateral consequence. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, that can be debated. Um, but I do think there is a misconception out there. I, again, I don't know the data, but I do think that um, if you look broad at all of the cases in the country that are not non-white collar cases mm -hmm. and whether those folks get greater sentences. I mean, we talk about a woman that registered her child 
uh, using a, a wrong address yeah. to get to get their child in a better school district and sentenced to five years yeah. for something like that. She wasn't rich. She was black. I mean, so you can't that tell. That was a state me. crime. That was a state crime. Yeah. Right. I, I think the disparity, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to, the, the state system I do think has the huge disparity mm -hmm. um, and does not, um, does not really uh, account for, you know, what we're talking about. I, I think that the state system is completely jacked up. There is a huge disparity between those who can afford counts and those who can't. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there's a difference between the state and the federal? <sighs> the guidelines. Mm. I, I think the guidelines have a lot to play with it because um, wh wh one, I think there's the guidelines uh, that come into play. The, the fact that you don't have parole in, uh, in the federal system. So you're doing 85% of the sentence. I think the fact that what the U.S. Attorney's Manual, as you say, sets forth, we are to charge the highest offense um, and we are to ask for the highest sentence possible. You know, um, I, I think those kind of things are what drive it on the federal side. Plus, they don't they don't take every case. And so on the state side, you're trying to move cases. Mm -hmm. and, and in moving a case, if you've got a defendant who can come up with a substantial portion of the restitution, somebody who has the means to do so, I think it's a lot easier for a prosecutor to give in and say, yeah, I'll, I'll give them deferred adjudication, no jail time. And they, they can come up with, you know, yeah, okay, they stole $100,000, they can pay back 50 of it to start and pay back the rest over, over time. Yeah, let's put them on a 10-year deferred and, and let them go down the road. And the, and, the, and the judges don't really have a problem with it, you know, because, again, the, the state system is so overloaded, they're trying to move cases. And so I think that and, unlike the federal system, I don't think the resources are there to really properly, I, I think a lot of state court prosecutors, they don't want to touch white-collar crime. It's a lot of paperwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah. we, we don't want to get into that. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, look, I agree with everything you guys said. Uh, the only thing I would add to it for your listeners is, um, you know, I, I think a way to consider looking at it, at least, I won't tell them to look at it like this, is um, it's not that, you know, rich or white collar or white or whatever category you want to put people in in the white collar arena um, are getting treated too leniently. It's that everybody else is getting treated too harshly or unfairly. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm not saying I'm certain of that, but it's just another perspective to have, right? Which is, um, this is what happens when you have the means to put up an appropriate defense to get good counsel. Um, sometimes you have the educational background yeah. to you know, almost aid in your own defense and think through the process. Where a lot of people in a lot of different contexts don't, don't have that. Um, they should. Right. And that's sure. what leads to, you know, you, you hear these stories where, oh, you know, um, uh, Manafort gets four years and the, a kid that stole a pair of sneakers right in Louisiana got 15 years. OK, well, what's wrong there is not Manafort getting four years. Yeah, it's the right. Kid getting it's the, the kid getting 15 years. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's not find ways to put Manafort in for, you know, to make sure he dies in prison. Right. Um, let's try to fix the other the, problem and the pro I agree with you uh, Dane on that but the problem is is that until we fix that system you know there are people who are getting disproportionately absolutely um, uh, punished and imprisoned and so what do you do in the stopgap you know does that kid keep getting 15 years I know. while while you know everyone else and I agree like I, I I'm a white collar defense attorney yeah. I, I certainly don't want my clients to get they, they high should sentences be more har yeah yeah they but should be more harshly punished um no I wouldn't say that I don't want anyone to be more harshly punished but but there's something needs to happen we can't just keep saying this as if you know it's just the way it is where people are spending their lives in prison unfairly yeah. too long here's an idea Thirty million dollars for a special prosecution, maybe more public defenders. Mm. Well, you know the interesting thing. So I, I, I do. I take appointments on the federal side. I've been on the CJA panel for a long time, and I mean, um, you know, I, I got into a debate with somebody the other day about whether or not do you try your hardest on the cases that you're appointed on versus the cases that you're retained on. And my point was, I, I give the same effort whether or not I'm appointed on a case Absolutely. or whether or not I'm, I'm retained on a case. The guy that pays me a large 
sum of money versus the person who I'm getting paid. You don't work hard on it. either of those. Huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, I, yeah. No, I, I mean, because for me, and, and, and I'm not saying every lawyer is like this, but I feel like as the lawyer, you should have enough pride in yourself that if you're going to take that court-appointed case, it's a reflection of you at the end of the day. You have to go up and make the arguments in front of the judge. You're the one who has to try the case. And if you don't have enough pride in yourself to say, I'm going to give it my all because this is my reputation on the line. This is how I perform, you know, then and, 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 and you just don't have this innate. I'm here. To, my job is to help somebody, you know. Yeah. And as a criminal defense attorney, yes. we're not talking about money here. Right. We're not talking about contracts between businesses. Correct. I mean, we are we are all that as criminal defense lawyers. We are what stand between our clients and their livelihood, their liberty. Yeah. I mean, um, I'll, whether I'll, they're paying client or not. Well, and I'll give you a great example. Um, I, I had a case, a healthcare fraud case that I was appointed to uh, at two and a half years ago uh, and worked my butt off on the case. And, you know, she was charged in a 29 count indictment plus a money laundering count and everything else. At the end of the day, we got really close to trial. And I convinced the prosecutor to dismiss the indictment and let her plead to an information on a tax count for filing one false tax return. Good for you. In 2012. And you know what she got? She got probation in federal court. That's a great result. Now, she was a young black female, um, and she wasn't treated any, any differently, um, I, I, I don't think, than anybody else. I mean, I gave her um, the best representation possible. We got an outstanding result. And the judge, you know, didn't sentence her to jail time for it. Um, and, and I think if you don't have enough pride in yourself to make a fight like that for somebody, don't take the case. You know, don't sign up for the panel. Don't go represent those people. Um, if you're not willing to fight as hard for the people that you get appointed on as the people that you retain for, that's where the problem lies. Okay. And I know plenty of lawyers, you know, David Adler, all these guys who, who are straddle the line between both court appointed and retain work. And they do hella jobs for their clients, Yeah, you know? And um, so I, I, I just think this is, I think you can take this report and just kind of throw it out the window in terms of how the normal federal case operates. It's just, it's, it, it just, that's not how it works every day for us and our clients. It's just not. We don't, right. we don't get the benefit of a 488 page report, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, we get, so we get, we yeah. get, no question. We get what we get. But and sometimes but, we don't get it all. Yeah. But our clients typically also don't have to suffer through a special investigation that is dedicated at them. Um, so it, I, I, I guess it's just, my point is, um, but it's, it but, cuts both ways and it right. might cut one way harder than the other, but, um, well, it's all about perspective, right? I mean, you're the president of the United States as, you know, kind of to, to paraphrase Puff Daddy and Biggie Smalls, more money, more problems. You know, I mean, you, you get up to the, that, that level, you, you're, you're asking target for more you. problems. You could get a target on your back versus, you know, it, but when you are an individual and you have the Department of Justice coming after you, even on a regular prosecution, it sure feels like a special prosecutor is coming after you. Okay, let's, we have to, there's kind of an elephant here, though. President Trump didn't make it easier on himself. No, he did not. But <laughs> I mean, there, there were... A lot of our clients don't make it easier on themselves <laughs> either. Sometimes some of them don't follow he all the rules. rarely makes it easier. <laughs> yeah. I, I will, would be I will say this. Nightmare. I, I think, well, first let me ask, is it, it may be a crime to suggest showing empathy to Donald Trump. Uh, you might get but, flogged and stoned but, in the streets. So, so I may, because yeah. I'm no supporter either. Um, but here's the empathy that I have for him. Um, to endure a three-year or two-year investigation of that magnitude, um, when what you've been saying from day one is, I didn't conspire with Russia, I don't think anybody from my campaign did, um, and basically everybody calls BS, right? Um, the thing I empathize with is I think most people would have a desire to do everything they thought they could legally do to let that side of the story and to tell their story come out mm -hmm. and to, to write that ship. Um, so I kind of get that. Like these, some of these things that he did, I at least from a human nature perspective can understand him trying to do. I 
I I gotta give you a hard time, Dane, because I like I like because, hard times. <laughs> yes, as a normal on. as a normal Joe down the street, yeah, you're gonna call your friend and try to figure out way. He is the president of the United States. That means something. You are no longer just Donald Trump. You represent our entire country. People that voted for you, people that didn't vote for you. You represent 200 plus years of history here. I mean, we have to, we ha he has to be held to a higher standard. And, and it, all I'm saying is that all of those things are true and he happened to be being accused of treason. So I just, I'm saying I get it, it's the desire a, to fight back. There were allegations. There was evidence that needed to be followed up on. An investigation did that. They concluded that there was no evidence of conspiracy. Um, they did not conclude that there was no evidence of obstruction. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, no one, no one forced him to run for president. No one forced any of this on him. This, this is par for the course here. Sure. Um, and I, you know, while I have a lot of empathy for a lot of people, um, he's not one of them, you know, <laughs> not in this circumstance. Not not in this circumstance, because one, he's still free. He's a free man with the powers of the president. Um, he is not being charged, at least right now. Um, he is still running for reelection. You know, he, he he hasn't given up. He seems to like the job. He wants another another round at it. Um, I just think um, I, I'm not sorry for Donald Trump. I, I, I think that we owe it to the people of this country to figure out what was going on, to investigate it, and um, to spend the resources. $30 million in the big scheme of things is not a ton of money uh, for this country. No, it's not. I, I think more, the hard part for me is, you know, he doesn't have, as, as this report said, he doesn't have the right to a speedy trial. He doesn't have the right to compel and confront witnesses and go through the normal process. So what is he left with? He kind of has to get on Twitter and get on the media and mount his defense that way, right? And the, the hard part is, to me, what if they do charge him after he gets out? Does he really is he really going to get a fair trial? You know, I mean, it. it, it it's what are hard. the odds of that actually happening? I don't think. I don't think. Right, he, I don't. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think so. I don't think it should yeah. happen. I yeah, mean, but I don't there's think a lot of people to. who think he should be that the state of New York should go after him, or that that he should be charged after he gets out. I I, I just I I do think that there should be if if he was impeached or you know if he loses the election, whichever comes first, uh, if if that's the route they decide to go or whatever based on this stuff. And I'm not saying they should or they shouldn't. I'm I'm not making any judgment anyway. But I, I just kind of feel like if we go down that route of impeachment, um, or let's say he's defeating the election, I just kind of think we should take a, a, an almost Nixon forward approach where it's like, just going down the road, you know? We so, said we, we, we said we weren't going to take a political stance, and I feel like we've gotten pretty no, political. I know. It just, it just, but here, so here's, the, to that. But here's <laughs> the ironic thing about, and the reason why I ask you the question, are we better off with the Mueller report than we were before? So we think there's meddling by the Russians in our election, right? And the purpose I don't think of that. We know. There's evidence of that. We no, know. No, no, I meant at the time okay. the, the yeah. investigation was started, it was because we thought there was meddling by the Russians okay. in, our, in our elections. And their intent in that, we thought and we've learned, was to create political discord in the country to meddle with those elections. Um, the Mueller report. Right? Did it solve that underlying political discord? All right, no. political chaos. Well, that's. I mean, it's it's it, it's just ironic to me. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's it's political discord, meddling, investigation. There's no crime there with the meddling, as far as the Trump campaign is concerned, and now more discord. Well, no, but and. 15 new felons that didn't exist <laughs> before the investigation started. But what you're hitting on is that we have learned, they have shown, it has been proven uh, from the evidence, it was not proven, there's been a trial, but um, Russians did interfere in our elections. I guess I just what are we gonna do? That. But what are we gonna do about that? Well, a foreign so power yeah. interfered in our elections. I mean, I, what is the president of the United States gonna do about that? 
I think See, that's I didn't this. need a, a special prosecutor to tell me that. You I didn't. mean, I, I thought, I, I assumed there was meddling in the election by well, the Russians. Well, just like we meddle in other people's elections. So we, <laughs> like, so I think the U.S. meddles in every election. So do we just let that go? Do no, we I'm just not, let it go? No, I don't think we should let it go. No, I think, I, I, what I'm, where I don't think we're better off because of this is, is even if you look at the president, what it says about the president and everything else, how do we get to the point where our national security is so vulnerable? You know, I mean, where, how have we gotten to the point that people can come in through Facebook, through Twitter, and sow this kind of discord amongst Americans, you know, and, and use it against us and turn it against us? And well, let's not be, I, I, I think we need to be clear here. The Russians didn't sow discord. There's already discord. True. They may have taken advantage of what's already there yeah. um, and try to sort of put a spotlight on some things that's already there. We we have issues that well, we're not really dealing with. Yeah, and I think we've, but, you know, to be fair, that's that's what we've done in other countries. You go in and you you, you incite. I'm staying far away from that. You incite <laughs> riots, you know, you, you incite the other side to, you know, come out. I mean, so I, I, I think... Yes. I mean, are, are, did they do anything that our country hasn't done? No, of course not. But uh, should we be concerned about it? Yes, absolutely. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? I, and I think, well, I'll let you finish. Well, no, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I want to know. Why, oh, I don't either. Public, that, why do we want to publicly put That's why I said I, I assume the plan. problem and I assume a solution yeah. will come from actions I don't know about, and whether or not there was a, a Mueller report, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, I don't. that's what I meant when I said I don't need a special prosecutor to say there was meddling and, and it's serious. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, anyone that cares about, most people that care about the Mueller report really didn't care about the Russian meddling, as evidenced by the main focus now being that meddling was found, but Trump campaign wasn't involved. <laughs> It's all about obstruction now, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that shows really, I think, to most people, it really is political. Yeah. And um, now that there's no Trump conspiracy with the Russians, the Mueller report's key finding is on obstruction. But, I mean, that's what that's most of what I'm hearing from people. My big takeaway that people should have, because we only have 30 seconds left. I know you thought this would last an eternity. <laughs> we are in the last 30 seconds. That I think is... Just shut the hell up when the FBI or any kind of law enforcement comes talk to you. It's hey, really that simple. Yes, people. If there's if there's anything that they can take away from this discussion, <laughs> um, if an agent comes to your doorstep, you do not have to talk to them. You do not have to talk to them. She just Go said get a lawyer. Obstruction. No, you are you are you have the right to an attorney, um, and I think a lot of people are intimidated when they show up. You have a right to an attorney. So call your, just say, can I have your card? I'll call you back when I talk to my attorney. When they come to talk to you or execute a search warrant, it's not a, a subpoena to appear. You're not being put in front of a grand jury. It's not a court order to saying, testify now. And you're Shut not, up. And you're not going to talk your way out of it. I know. That's you're right. You're not going to talk your way out of it. Not you right You might away. talk your way into it. <laughs> definitely talk your way into it. Not going to talk your way out of it. Yeah. So what did you think first time? Fun. Yeah. So yeah. You're all worried. You should have me back. I, we intend to. <laughs> I mean, see, you're all worried about an hour with no break. An hour time. Yeah. No, that was fun. <sighs> so now I've, I've made it where you want to come back. Now you're excited. Yeah. You're like, wait, wait, let's go another hour. Yeah. <laughs> I want more of Dane Ball. <laughs> Dane was great. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun conversation. It was fun. It was a fun conversation. Yeah. We need to do it again. Um, that's all the time we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank my guests, Dane Ball and Ashley McFarland, for joining me. Uh, if you have any comments that you want to leave, go to our Twitter page at HCCLA underscore TV. Uh, you can also go to our Facebook page for HCCLA uh, and leave a comment there. I think we actually, and we're going to have to talk about this, I think the reasonable doubt it, Facebook page is down right now. So leave a comment on the HCCLA Facebook page. But that's all the time we have for this week. I apologize for my co-host and his prior commitments, but hopefully he'll be back next week or the week after that or when, whenever he decides this show is important to him again. So <laughs> good night, everybody. We'll see you next time.